Um, okay, so this is a lecture about the foundations related to web development. So it might be quite easy for those of you who are already quite advanced, they're very familiar with all the languages, and uh, say JavaScript, you can create the code website already fairly confidently. And But for those who is the first time, who haven't really done any create any web page before, this will be quite useful. These are all small, tiny details, but will be very useful for your coursework. Um, let's start. Okay, so we start with a general introduction. We have three main languages to do web development. The first one is HTML, which all of you, you know. But and I just want to emphasize, this is about the content of the page, and which are things like the text images and videos, which allowed you to add these contents to a web page. And the second one is a CSS. CSS is for formatting. So formatting, in the sense, allows you to change the font, the color, the layout of the page. And uh, finally, we have JavaScript, and which is closer to a lang programming language than the others. And it's uh, mostly for interactivity, so you'll be able to reaction provide reactions or response to user actions. For example, if you mouse over and the color or the link will change, we can click a button or show a menu, etc. etc. So these are done using JavaScript. And uh, the, some people might be confused that with Java, because they both have Java in their name. Okay, and that's like uh, happened maybe 20 years ago when JavaScript was first introduced. And at that time, Java was really popular, and uh, JavaScript decided to share some of the syntax, for example, the keywords that are similar to Java, and they decided to put the name in its language name as well. So that's how the JavaScript came about. But these two are very different uh, languages. So basically, if you write anything in JavaScript, it will not be able to run as a Java code, and vice versa. Okay, and uh, one of the main thing about these langu three languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, they are not full programming languages, and so they are not like things like um, Java was a good example, C++, or maybe like C Sharp now, or even like Python. They are more, has more features and as a programming language. And, but as a result, and these languages are simpler, simpler than the other ones I mentioned, and easier to learn. And uh, they are really mainly designed for front-end, so what people see on the screen. They are not designed to, say, do heavy computations or store data, which are mostly for the backend, which is better done with the other languages. Okay, and uh, again, a bit more background. So the only reason that any browser or any can display any page and people put on the web now is because these languages follow certain standards. So for example, if everyone uses an own little language to create websites, and then that web page or website will be only be displayed or it can be visible or work properly in this specific process. So that's why standards and specification are very important. And uh, anyone heard of W3C before? It's a standard. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like the organization which is responsible for creating a standard for all these languages. So they were creating HTML5 and CSS3. And these are what they are responsible. This organization is responsible for, and it has, say, participation of all the big and tech companies or web companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and some academics in there as well. So you should all know him. Yes. No. Okay. So he's one of the most famous and British computer scientists, and he. Tim Berners-Lee, or maybe you should call Sir now, and he is the inventor of the web, and so that's a little bit different and from the inventor of internet. There's two different things. So he didn't invent the internet. Anyone knows the difference between internet and the web? 
they are not quite the same thing. So when people say internet, and it usually refers to the lower level, the hardware level of the network. So these are, say, the network cables, the routers, or these machines to make it possible to connect. Whereas web is the software part, which is actually the user can see. So we can see a web page in a browser. That's the web. So he's the inventor of the web. Okay, and uh, that's a very long and uh, say attractive name is the group which designs all the standards for the web development. Okay, so they're developing, for example, the latest specification for HTML, which is five. <coughs> okay, and uh, so HTML five itself, um, or let's say in general HTML itself as a standard is changing all the time. So maybe a couple of years ago, HTML5 itself is not even a standard yet. So basically, there's no common agreed or say official way, specification for HTML5. And now, I think the latest proposal they have, they have now is 5.2. So they have more features added, they have more changes. So you need to be aware and say, um, it's changing all the time. So maybe by the time you finish your degree, and HTML6 has already come out with many new features. Okay, um, I'm not going to do this again because of time, but we saw this, say, visualization last week to show the different web technologies and how they evolve over time. Um, let me see if I can pick, okay. So for example, you can see this is where the HTML starts in about 1991, that's version 1.0. And this is when 2.0 happened, and that's where 3.0 happened. And then it come a long, um, a long time. Here is where HTML4 happened. So that's roughly in 1996. So between the 4 and the 5, there's a huge gap. So it takes about 20 years before it moves on to HTML5. So between 1996 till now. And there's other things you can have a look at yourself um, later. Okay, and a little bit more on the background of HTML. So it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And Hypertext means you can link different documents. And the markup means um, it's a kind of scripting language. You specify the content. For example, if you want to say that's the title, you have to put H1 in it. That's a markup. Okay, as we saw in the previous um, picture, so starting in the 1990s, and it's very simple, as you can imagine, the first few versions. And uh, so the HTML5 is a most current version, and it takes a long time for the standard to go from 4 to 5. Okay, and we'll see a little bit later on the main new features in HTML5. And, but uh, mainly there are two things. Uh, one thing that's new in HTML5 is support uh, for the web page to be better understood by the computers. Okay, so up to four, it's mainly the web page is designed for the user to see it in the browser. But then, so when the say with things like Google search becomes much more relevant, they realize there's a need for the web page much more easier to understand by the algorithm as well. So let's say an algorithm when they go through your HTML code, it's not like a human, they will see a picture on this browser. The way they look at it is look at the content and try to understand what is, this page is about. And also, this is related to the like a kind of like a new industry called a search engine optimization, or SEO, anyone heard of? Yeah, so the reason is because now, if you create a website, you put online, the chance people will visit is very small. Maybe for months or weeks, no one will even discover it. Now, most common way people discover something is through Google. So for example, if you want to create an online shop, you want to sell, say, mobile phones. And uh, if Google, if people type in mobile phones or shopping mobile phone in the Google search, and if your page does not show up in the first search page of, if your website does not show up in the first page of search results, the chance people will go to your website is very, very small. Does that make sense? 
Very, very few people would go to the second or even third page of the Google search results. Mostly they will find that what they want, because there's so many alternatives. Probably the first one or two will be good enough already. Okay, so there's this now a whole industry, okay, this industry now, try to help websites move their web pages higher in the Google search results. Say so ideally in the first page or even the first one appeared on the first page. Okay. And to do that, it very importantly is to make sure your web page or website can be understood by the Google search algorithm very well. Does that make sense? So the better the Google understand your web page, the higher the rank will appear. There's many other factors as well, but that's a general side. And HTML5 introduced a lot of things which help the Google algorithm or any other algorithm to understand your web page better. That's one of the main things. And uh, there's some other useful features as well. For example, you now can play video natively in the browser. So you might still remember a few years back, you have to install Flash Player before you can play video on a website. Now that it becomes obsolete, you can HTML. Most browsers can play back video natively. So these are the things, major changes, examples of major changes in HTML5. OK. Uh, so as one of the results, so and we don't need or much less likely need plugins for browsers. So the plugins are something you have to install when the browser cannot open certain type of files. So video was a very good example. Previously you have to install Flash, which is a plugin, before you can and play in your browser. So these are some examples. Even Java itself is. And uh, so in HTML5, the standard purports the standard uh, file formats. Let me try this. So the standard file formats, but also more. So it supports and different image format, which is not that much a big advance compared to before, because previously it can also support pictures, and it supports more format of audio. So previously it's only wave and which is type of audio is not compressed, so very big, actually not very suited for a um, web page. And uh, so you probably all heard of MP3, which is, say, a few years ago, the standard of and recording or storing music. And OGG is like an open source uh, version of next version of MP3. And the ACC is like, a, essentially, the audio part of MP4. So you all heard of MP4, it's a new way to compress store videos. And it can support video as well. Again, you have MP4, which is a non-open source version, which can play natively in the browser. And the WebM, or OGG, is the equivalent of the open source one. Um, yeah. OK, and so we might come back to the video a little bit later, but we want to talk about plugins and why we don't want them. So you need to install these, and you will have compatibility issues, you have to keep update them, and you have performance issues, and also security issues. So basically, uh, the people developing the browsers has no control of plugins. So a plugin can be very badly designed, it runs slow, use lots of memory, or it can introduce and security flaws so people can get access to your computer. And all these things, the people developing the browser, like the Chrome, Microsoft, or even Apple, they cannot control and can be a bit um, dangerous. And also, um, one of the main issues is they cannot be found by search engines. Um, so for example, for a long time, so Flash is like a closed black box. You can be able to run it on a web page but you cannot see what's inside or code inside. You cannot see what's the text or pictures, image inside. And for something like a Google search engine algorithm, it will not be understand what's in there. It can only see, okay, there's a flash object on the page. It doesn't know whether it's about cars or about animals or anything. So that makes it very bad for the search engine operation we just mentioned before. And so don't use any, and you would not need to use any to complete coursework for this module and you should not use any of them. Okay, so, so the last one, so Adobe 
announced it will kill Flash in 2020. So that means Adobe itself will not support Flash anymore in 2020. So there's really not much point to start investing on them these now. Okay. Uh, the next one is CSS and stands for Cascading Style Sheet. And so, Style Sheet means it gives you the formatting information, how it looks. And the cascading is how the rules defining CSS works, which will come a bit more later. Yeah, Style Sheet means uh, the appearance and cascading style sheet is the most common one. Again, W3C, the designs and the specification or the formal standard and as you imagine start with version 1 and then 2, 2.1 and the latest one is CSS3 okay um, okay so this is a quite important point so the main reason people introduce CSS is to separate uh, content from format or formatting so when we say content we mentioned before these are the text these are the images, these are the videos, and formatting is the position, is the size, is the color, okay? And I think there is, how do I say, um, people, or at least at the very beginning, people tend to want to mix the two together and kind of like a Microsoft Word. When you're creating Microsoft documents, you type all the text, but you do all the formatting in the same document. You change the font size, position, exactly the same place. But this is actually not very good. For example, if you want to reformat your document using a different font or different size or different alignment, then you have to go through the entire document. But if the document, the content, the text, and formatting are stored separately, and you will be able to change the formatting without affecting the content at all. Okay, we're going to see some examples later on. And also very importantly is um, when we're creating web pages or websites, usually you have multiple web pages and very, in most cases, you want to the formatting to remain consistent across the pages. You don't want to say the second page looks different than the first one, and the third page looks exact, again different. And sometimes, because the design itself is changing all the time, for example, after a while, say I want to design to change to a different font or use a different background color, and then if you have multiple changes and the formatting information is within each pages, then you have changed every single page. Every time you make one, change one of the formattings. Does that make sense? If you have 20 pages, you have changed it, changed it 20 times. But if you have the formatting separate from the page itself, then you only have to change it once and it'll apply to all the pages. So that's another benefit of separating the two. Okay, um, so, okay, let me see if this works. So this is the example. Uh, and so this is the website. Um, it's developed using something called WordPress, which is not particularly relevant. But I just want to demonstrate, and um, because the separation between the text or the content on page and formatting, you can change the whole look or feel of the f um, uh, of the website in a few seconds. Uh, just waiting to connect. Hmm. It doesn't want to connect. No, go there.
What? <laughs> Um, okay, I'm sorry about that. I just couldn't get the Wi-Fi to connect. And um, it's working now. And so this is a website, which essentially is a blog. And but for demonstrate purpose, it doesn't really matter uh, which one you want to use. And uh, because the content of the page and the formatting is completely separated, so you'll be able to change it very easily. For example, right. so that's how it looks currently. And I can choose anything else to make my website look differently. And um, for example, let's say this one. Ah, oh, they changed everything. No, that's not how I wanted. Support. Hmm. Okay. Activate is free. Okay, I'm sorry about this. It looks like I um, would not be able to. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just change. Um, so, oops. Okay, so this is what website looks like currently. And if I want to change the look, I can apply a different <laughs> set of formatting, and which is called seams here. And if I choose any of these seams, for example, this one, and if I choose activate, okay. 
Um, I don't want to customize. Okay. Uh, no. Can we just go back to the side? <laughs> okay, so you can see this is and the new look of the site now, and it's completely different from the previous one. But actually, all the information is exactly the same. And uh, maybe just to quickly change to another one. So if I change to, let's say, this one, if I activate, and, and view the site. OK, again, so the site, the looks and feel is, again, completely different. So that's what you can do. So if you have the content, which is HTML, and it says to separate it, you'll be able to change it very quickly without affecting the content at all. OK, uh, so that's the example. Now we move on to JavaScript. So it's mostly about adding interactivity to the web page. And uh, it's initially designed as a scripting, scripting language. So it's relatively lightweight compared to other languages like Java. And uh, probably most popular because everyone uses browser and it's all run JavaScript. And uh, you can do lots of things. You can do animations, and you can dynamically change. For example, add a picture, remove a button from the page. You can do validation. So that's probably happens all the time when you say to create a password or check does it meet the requirements. Have to at least say eight characters. Have to have a number or underscore, etc. As I mentioned before, JavaScript is not Java, so they're different. There's some similarities in syntax for the basic ones, and uh, but there's quite there's the difference. Let's say the difference is much more than the similarity. Okay, and uh, we're going to go through this and quite quickly as well. So we saw some examples. You can create very very complex applications in browser now. So examples like Office and done by Microsoft or the Google Drive. And we saw last week, so I'm not going to open these again. OK, and this is, again, quite important And when we're understanding how the web developer work. So it basically works off this client-server architecture. And there's a fairly fancy name, but there's nothing that difficult. So it just basically means there's a front end, which is client, and there's a backhand, which is the architect, which is the server, and they do different things. And this is usually how it works. So it's usually start from the client side, and this could be a computer, could be a tablet, could be a smartphone. And there's also the server, which is the remote. But these are basically just still and computers that are connected to the network. And you have the connection that links these two together. So these are usually internet. And the internet is not one thing, and it's usually part of many different things. For example, currently for my laptop to connect to the backend server, whatever it is, so it might have to go through Wi-Fi first, and then go through from the local Wi-Fi router to the university server, and the university server then goes through lots of other servers before it actually goes to and the server which the data is stored. Okay, and then for the client, to talk to the server or the front end, talk to the back end, you need something called a protocol. So it's almost uh, like uh, your languages. When two people need to talk, they have to speak or understand the same language. So what happens is usually uh, the client will send a request, say, I want to open Google search web page, or I want to log in to my Facebook page. So the client will send a request. These will send through the internet following certain protocol and the server will receive it and then will do something. So in terms of the Google search, it will be quite easy. So okay, to return the page of the Google search front page. And for the and Facebook login, it might just take your login 
and details, you enter your name, username and password and check and then decide okay if it's not correct it will send back an error message and if it's correct it will send back your home page etc and it's got sent back and then it will be displayed on your, uh, the browser on the client side okay so this is very important uh, let's already talk about and so the important things here is and um, for the first semester we can only looking at the front end. So any we only look at what's happening on the client side. And in the second semester we're gonna talk about okay, how do we, the front end talk to the back end, how do you talk to the database, how do you do the communications in between the two. Okay. Um, so so that's about the general background about web development you should be aware of and it's uh, quite important and next part and is quite practical things you need to be aware when you're actually creating websites so in this case mostly about creating the web pages and so the first you should plan your website so we talked a little bit more about the sketching design web pages before really? Um, okay, is this better? Yeah, that's okay. better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and um, let's continue. And now we'll try to. Okay, and hope everyone can be quiet. If you really want to talk, you can go out and talk. Yeah. Okay, and um, so the first and um, practical thing you need to do is plan your website a little bit. So, in terms of and what do you want to present there? How do you design or include the content for the people that you want you to use websites? And your structure, how many pages you want? And how do they link together? So you may come up with something like this and each box represents a page and you show how they are linked together. That's the commonly thing you will do, practically. Okay, again, this is a tiny thing, but I see that being done, being done run many many times. So first, and the default page, or the first page people go to your website should see, has to be called index.html. Okay, and this is not very intuitive, intuitive, intuitive names. So I see lots of people want to do homepage.html or some other names, but this is a rule set by say a long time ago by a server. So basically that means. If you are typing a URL without specifying any pages, for example, you type in google.com, so by default, it will go to the website and then looking for index.html file, and if it can find it, it will try to display it, and if it can't, actually it will report an error. Okay, and for example, if you have a website and you want to have your starting page called, say, startingpage.html, then every time, people go to your website, it have to type in the site name, for example, three w dot, I don't know, and webdevelopment.com, and then they have to type slash, and then starting page dot html. Does that make sense? Because if they do, don't do the slash starting page dot html part, and the server actually will tell them an error, so they can't find the website, but actually the website is there. But instead, if you have your starting page called index.html, then the people don't have to type slash index.html all the time. They just have to type the URL, so it's www.webdevelopment.com. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So just tiny thing, but very useful. And okay, um, as I explained, so if you use the typing something. In this, in the browser, the browser will by default looking for this URL. And if your starting page got something else, or this page does not exist, they will tell you find not find error, which is something like that, this, which is you don't want. So basically, that means that people probably would not even try to visit a website ever again. They think it's not working. They will not, probably never come back. Okay. Uh, another very small thing, about, uh, but quite useful, is to think about how to you organize your files. 
So when you first started your website, you probably only has one HTML files, maybe a couple of pictures, or maybe later on one CSS files. But as the website grows bigger, these files get much, much more. Okay, you can easily have maybe several HTML files, a few CSS, maybe dozens of pictures, or maybe even some JavaScript or even video files as well. So at this time, at this stage, you really want to organize your files a bit better rather than say put all the files in one directory. Does that make sense? So you open directory, have lots of files there, very difficult to see which one or find the one you want. Okay, and there's different ways, and these are the su suggestions, not say requirements. So for example, you can create subfolders for each page. So if you have 10 pages for each page, you have a subfolder, so that's my home page, and you have everything in there, say all the HTML files, CSS, or the pictures or the video for that particular page. That's one way. Or you can create um, subfolders for file types. You put all the pictures in one subfolder, all the um, say videos in one subfolder, etc., etc. So it's also much more organized. Okay, and so long as either one is okay, you may come up with some other ways you want to organize your files yourself. That's completely fine, but just don't put all the files in one directory. Yeah, be a little bit more organized. Okay, so this again is something you probably think you think you all know. Okay, but then there's some subtle and difference and for web pages. So the names used to identify files. So for example, at the bottom, and we see this file, which is quite common. Okay, and the first thing is use lower cases. Don't use any up cases. So. So most of these files, when they go on live, it will be hosted on a server, and these mostly run Linux or similar systems. And in these systems, and whether it's uppercase or lowercase in the file name, it will be treated differently. So, for example, and the one on the left is buckminsterfuller.html, and on the right is still exactly the same name file name except. So it's capital B underscore and capital F. I mean, as a human, using, but for the computer, these are two completely different files. Okay, for example, if you want to link to this particular page, and uh, the file name is Buckin Buckmin Buckminster underscore folder, and you typed in this way, even if you use, say, underscore here, it will not recognize it. It will say, can't find the file. Does that make sense? So, and this is sometimes where people will say, okay, why the file is exactly there? Why it doesn't work? So just to make things a little bit easier is just to use all lower cases. So you never have to worry about the case when you actually have an upcase in your file name. Yeah. Okay. And, all, and often say lower cases is easier to type than the upper cases and also actually easier to read as well. Okay, then, and then a very s and small detail is about when you want to multiple words, you want to connect them, the recommended, and the recommended symbol is hyphen or dash. So do not include in space, and that's quite dangerous. And when it's okay on Windows, the dangerous of using space is and the file or the operating system may think the file name stops when there is a space. Okay, so for example, if you look at this file name, if instead of um, under, say, dash here or hyphen here, is a space, uh, the computer or the operating system may, may think the file name of this file is called Buckminster, and that's a second file name. Okay, and you obviously don't want to happen because they cause error again. And again, so some people will be rather using underscore, which is kind of the only thing you can use, for example, in some of these relational databases like MySQL. They really say if you want to connect multiple words, you can only use underscore. And, but again, for some reasons, the servers or search engines like hyphen much better, sometimes doesn't work well with underscore. 
Again, so the general guideline will be just using hyphen. Okay, and uh, another small tiny detail, using HTML instead of HTM. So HTM is like the next issues. And if anyone used the Microsoft DOS system or heard of it, this is like maybe 30 years old now. And at that, let's say 30 years ago at that time, you have a limit of three characters for file extensions. But now that's, it's long gone, you can easily have more than three, I think 128 characters in file extensions. So use the full name HTML. And also, for example, um, they were looking for the default page as index.html, not HTML. Okay, uh, that's tiny details, but will make your life a little bit easier because it could, could cause errors, which is quite difficult to find. Okay, um, uh, very quickly talk about URL, um, which you type all the time. We have an example at the bottom right corner. It's like the address of the files you can find online. Just like you can find a person or company in the real world, you need address. And same if you want to file, find the file online, you need address. Uh, okay, so actually a little bit of details. You start with a scheme, which tells you the language you want to talk about. So HTTP is one of the most common ones to transfer web pages. And you have the server name. That's where the file is hosted. And sometimes you have a directory, just as you have subdirectory for your website. And finally, the file name. And uh, there's quite a few other protocols or language commonly used to communicate on the internet. So we see HTTP, which is common for websites or web pages. And then HTTPS, S stands for secure. And in the sense, the communication will be encrypted. So without HTTPS, the talking or the communication between your computer and the server is in plain text. And basically anyone can actually see what is being communicated. And the S part, make it encrypt so you need a password before you can understand otherwise you just see some random code and FTP is actually most of the website now should be using HTTPS and FTP stands for file transfer protocol and as a design it's used to transfer files but it's actually not very po um, popular now so that's the example of FTP Okay, so mail to is for sending emails, and if you have a URL or something like this in your web page, and when people click on it, it will open the default email editor and address to this particular person. And uh, okay, so this is another one which is particularly referred to the local files. Okay, and when you're creating your website, you really should not have any of these. So, for example, in this one, it says, I want to find a local file stored on C drive in the past directory and called home.html. And if you create a link like this in your web page, when the page being live on the server, there will not be a C drive, a pass, or home, so it will not work. Does that make sense? Yeah? We'll explain, we'll explain a little bit later how you should create a link. Okay, and so there's two ways, and one is called absolute URL. This is like your full post address. So you start with, say, the number and the building number, street, say, area, postcode, even country. So that's like the absolute URL, so you have everything. So, okay, so this example of absolute URL, so you have the site, the directory, and file name. So you can always find this complete info with all these information. Okay, and you use this when you need to reference a file from a different server. For example, if you want to include a video from YouTube website, so that's not on your own, let's say the video itself is stored together with the web pages, it's on a different server. 
So this is when you have to use absolute URL. You have to tell it to go to the YouTube server and where to find the video there. Okay, and there's other ways, okay, and which is called the relative URL. And so this is, for example, if you ask me directions, how do, how do I find room, let's say, CG21, I will tell you, go downstairs two levels and turn right, etc., etc. I don't have to tell you, and it's in UK, it's in Hamden, what the postcode is, all other information is not needed, because it's the same as what you are now. All you need to do is just a re relatively uh, address from what you are currently at. So that's what the relative URL is. Okay, uh, so let me see, it should, should be some examples. Okay, so for example, if you only have a name, file name, in this case index.html or cat.jpg without directory or server, so that assumes that file is in the same directory as the file it's being linked to. Does that make sense? So for example, you have the index.html page and you want to link to some cat pictures which are called cat.jpg and you say I want to link to just cat.jpg and it will try to find that image file in the same directory where this index.html is. Yes? And you can do this as well. Now you have a directory. So, so this time if you have a directory, it will go looking for that subdirectory and inside subdirectory and looking for the particular file. So if we point you to image slash cat.jpg, so we we'll try to find a subdirectory called image first and go inside there to find cat.jpg, which is quite common say when you organize your files, had all the images in one subdirectory. Okay, and this is a little bit more tricky in the sense you have two dot first, and then image, and then the file, or then the directory name and the file name. So the two dot means you need to go one level up in the directory file tree structure. That's it. That is a special way to say when you need to go one level up. That's how you do it. Okay. So let's do some practice. So let's say we have two web servers. Uh, on the left, left one is called site.com and on the right hand side is a different server called remote.com and on the site.com you host all your web pages you created and you have these directories and you have a directory called about and inside you have another directory, subdirectory called info under info you have data.html file and your index file.html is stored under in the about directory and in the same directory also you have the ur here.html and there's another directory which at the same level as about which is called image and it has image.png does that make sense? yeah so that's quite typical it's like windows you open the explorer you would see something like this all the time and you have a different server which has a slightly different set of directory structure and files. Okay, and you can always refer to all these uh, files. Like the first one is index.html, which is this one, and there's data.html, which is this one. So, for example, use absolute in URL, and for this file, it should be called as HTTP, which is a protocol, site.com, which says this site and in the about directory, which is this about directory, and under that you would find index.com, oh sorry, index.html, yeah? And uh, for data.html, which exists here, you still say have to say this, this the website, site.com, under the about directory, which is about, and then under info directory, and then you can find data.html. Okay, and the skipped image, uh, your episode. But for example, the next one is called news.html, which is actually on a different website. So the URL will become 
not site.com anymore, but remote.com, and then press, which is the directory, and then use.html. And similarly, that's a different index.html for this website. Okay, the next part of the exercise is to find the relatively URL should be if this is the current page. So let's say this is your current page and you want to link from this page to all the other pages you have. Okay, so if we want to link from urhere.html to index on this website, which is this file, and what would be the relative URL? Anyone? It's not that difficult. Just indexation. Sorry? It's just a normal file because it's in the same Anyone else? So yes. So you can see relative to this file, which is the starter point where we are now, index.html is in the same directory as it. So all you need to do is just the file name. So it will go find it. Okay. Next one is slightly harder. If you want to find data.html, what would be the relative URL? Sorry? Yeah. So the site about info. Um, site about info. Okay. But what you can see also is um, data.html is here, and compared to this one, it's like one level down from here under the info directory and inside info directory there's a data so there's a simpler way you can just say slash info and then slash data.html okay because it's, it's under it's a subdirectory from where the current file is and inside that is data.html okay uh, next one is this an image.png, which is this file here, and uh, what would the relative URL be look like? Oh, Sorry? Uh, okay, so and there's one answer, it says it's slash img slash img.png, right? Any other tries? Yeah? Okay, so a second answer is you need two dot before the slash image directory and then slash image dot png. Yeah, and because and um, you actually this directory is not under where this file are, you have to go one level up here and then go down. Okay, that could happen. Okay, the next one, news.html, which is this file here. And uh, what would be the relative URL is in that case? Anyone? No? Press. Press? So, okay, and we'll have one answer, it says slash press slash news.html. Is that more or less what you want? Yeah. Any other? Okay, this is a little bit tricky question. Um, you can't do it, basically. And because it's on a different server, and you can't have a relative URL, you always have to use a full uh, URL or well, the absolute one you have to tell which server it is before specifying the directory and the file name. And similarly for the last one, because it's on a different server, you can always have to use absolute URL. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a better idea of how to use these. Okay, and uh, yeah, should be okay. And so fairly quickly, and so we're we'll creating a web page. And you will start writing code either HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. And the only thing I want to say is use a text editor. 
And text editor means something you cannot do the formatting of the text itself. So it can be notepad, and that's text regular for my Mac OS. And that's all. And probably the simplest examples. And basically, you can't do any change, say, font or color. If you see that option, and you will realize it's not text editor, and it's not good for the coding. And because if you save the file, whatever that is, it will save the text formatting information in, the, in your file as well. So it will save information like what the color or font the text should be. And the browser will not understand that, because that's not HTML. So you can't use Microsoft Word or even text editor on Mac, because they all try to, you can always have formatting information in them. And also, and uh, do not use any generators. Okay, so many of these advanced and editors, which will have a lot of some of them very soon, allows you to automate certain things, make it much faster, but we not allowed to use, or you're not allowed to use any uh, website which creates, or tools that create the code for you. So examples include Microsoft Word and Dreamweaver. And first, of course, I want you to write code yourself, not code generated by these softwares. But also there's other potential issues, is you don't really have control at, or know exactly what happened. And uh, you will have very big file size, and as a result, very difficult to fix errors. Um, so let me see if this works. OK, it doesn't. Um, let me see if we can fix this one. Yeah, it's there. Let's try again to see if it looks better this time. Okay, um, so this is our first page. Quiet, please. Sorry about the break, but please be quiet. Okay, so... This is our first page, and it's very simple. It only has one heading. Say so this is the heading. Okay. And uh, this is our second page. Again, it's very simple. Let me zoom to the same level so you can see it. Okay. Again, it's just one heading. It says this is a heading. Can you see any difference visually? Okay, but the way that I can't see my personal link, see it my, myself, maybe there's a tiny bit and difference, but I can't see it. But there's the way they saved is different. The first one, um, if you can read the file name, it's just called title.html, is what I created in the browser myself by typing HTML code. So if you look at it, it looks something like this. Okay, so that's a very simple HTML code. You say the HTML tag, and you have body, and you have a heading, which is has a text inside heading. And if you look at this one, the title of the file name may give you some clue. It's actually called title Microsoft Word.html. So what I did is I typed this text in Microsoft Word and then choose save as HTML file. Okay? And I can show you what Microsoft created. Okay, so this is the pane, all the code uh, Microsoft created. Okay, and if you scroll all the way down, um, you will just see your text, which is roughly here. <laughs> okay, so that's a dangerous. So, of course, Microsoft is improving. They do not put as much junk now, but it's still more or less doing a similar thing. 
So that's the problem. So you don't have control. You don't know exactly what the code will be generated. And once it's done, if you want to change anything, for example, if you have to understand all these code, which does not really make sense just for change simple things. Okay. So you're not allowed to use these things. So Drupal is slightly better, but in some cases, still do the same things. Okay, so that's why we're not using these. Okay, and uh, so we showed you some very simple text editors you can use, like a Notepad or Text Wrangler. And that's as because the web development is progressing fast, very fast, getting more and more complex. There's lots more advanced than text editors or code editors to make your life a little bit easier. And um, this one um, is completely my personal opinion, nothing scientific. But more or less, and you can categorize these different uh, editors along two dimensions. And uh, the first one is the size of the editor. So if you have a small size, which is usually desirable, so it's a small file, fast to download, but more importantly, fast to run, and it will take less memory and make use, and everything will be faster. And usually, the larger the file size, and say it will take a long time to download, take up more your storage space on your hard drive, take a longer time to start up, and once it start up, you usually take up much, uh, much more memory as well, make the whole computer much slower. So in general, you want to do something smaller uh, rather than bigger. And but then on the other side. Um, you have the features. So basically, the things will make your life a little bit easier doing the coding. Uh, you can have things with very little features. It's not even listed here, for example, Notepad, which almost does not give you any help for coding. Okay, And your life will be quite difficult if you can try. And there's one which will give you lots more features, which I'll see some examples later on. And along these dimensions, and obviously you want to, something has more features. <coughs> and, but there's one thing is, sometimes you can have so many features, and, but you don't really need all of them. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. So this is some of the popular editors and I'm aware of, or I tried myself. And so maybe start from this end. Notepad++ is probably the most popular one. I think last year, maybe all, almost all students would be using it or at least start with that. And uh, it is not a bad one. You can completely use it. And, but what I would suggest is if you want to use Notepad++, you should look at into different plugins it has because Notepad++ is, itself is not designed for web development. It's designed as a general editor for different code. And you need to install extra plugins to make your life a little bit easier there. And similar is the Sublime Text. Anyone heard of it before? Yeah. So it's quite a good one. It was actually maybe my recommended editor, text editor, maybe two years ago. Okay, so that's what it looked like. And um, it's about the same size as Notepad++, and it actually has more features than that. And also, it has more plugins, a uh, very large uh, developer community. Uh, there's also, where's the mouse? Oh, come on, I need the mouse. Okay, I have to try to get my mouse back here. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes. So there's a bracket. Um, which is also quite popular. We used that actually in the module uh, last year. Um, you can see, and um, it's a little bit larger than these ones, but it has more function building. Um, it's actually also quite good, so it's completely fine if you want to use it. And it's, I think the main thing is, it's specifically designed for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it's very targeted, so it's nothing else. And uh, this is something called a Visual Studio Code. Ah, maybe just let you see what it looks like. If I just click on that one, that's what bracket would look like. Okay. So 
This is called the Visual Studio Code, which is uh, my new favorite, only starting this year, and that's the one I recommend this year. So first, it has very little to do with Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is uh, like a huge software come from Microsoft, it takes up gigabytes of space to install. That is different complete. Uh, Visual Studio Code is actually built on top of Chrome. We're going to show that in the lab, but it's actually built on top of Chrome. It's essentially a browser. But it doesn't look like a browser at all. It has lots of nice functions. It has a very active community creating new extensions. So we're going to have a look at in the lab this week about Visual Studio, what you can do. And so if we move, move along here, so these are the things which file size getting bigger and bigger, and but also has more features as well. And Atom, anyone? You heard of Atom? So it's made by GitHub, which is like open source repository of lots of projects, and it's quite good. And I think it has similar set of features as Visual Studio Code, but the file size is quite a bit bigger. And finally, we have this group here. So you probably all have came across NetBeans and Eclipse, right? And it's quite popular for Java development, and you can use them for web development as well as a code editor. Sorry, and but if you want to this like a full featured IDE or editor, and sometimes I think they have too many features I probably never use. I would recommend something called WebStore, which is it's like an enhanced version of Eclipse, but built specifically for web development. Does that make sense? So if you want to go all the features you can ever want, and instead of pick NetBeans or Eclipse, pick WebStore, which is about similar size but much more targeted for web development. So it looks like this. And uh, I think uh, it is not free, but for students you can get free license. Yeah. Okay, so these are the ones. And we're going to talk more about Visual Studio and later. But in general, anything listed down here is fine. Okay, don't use Notepad or text edit, that will make your life much harder. Okay, and you could also do online editor, which is something called Code Pen, which essentially is editor, but you don't have to install anything, it runs in your browser. And uh, it's a link there. Okay, so this is what Code Pen looks like. And you have, I'm not sure if you should open this one. Okay, there's a, someone put their code there, and you can see that's the HTML code, that's the CSS code, and that's the JavaScript <coughs> code they did, and this should work. I'm sure it works fine, otherwise they wouldn't put it there. Okay, uh, okay, I so we're doing okay. And another thing, again, small things, but very important, um, is about um, code formatting. Uh, it, code formatting does not change the function of code. If your code doesn't work, change the formatting, it still doesn't work. And if your code runs fine, it doesn't matter how you format, it will run fine. But it's very important for people to understand. So you have this example, which is a simple HTML page, which is properly formatted. And you can have exactly the same code in this format. It will show exactly the same thing and, but the second one is much harder for you as a human to read. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as we as the code gets longer, it can becomes harder and harder to spot errors or make changes just to find where you want. So it's highly recommended you do proper code formatting like this. Okay. And the actually is benefit of this this type of code is it actually is slightly smaller than this one because it saves the information of our space at the beginning of the line and the line break at the end. So when this is very, very large, it actually there are certain tools which will allow, and uh, they could minimize your code, minify this code into this, but that's a different issue. In this module, when you write the code, do it this way. Yeah? And the good news is, you don't really actually have to do much, for example, the Visual Studio Code Editor can do this automatically for you. 
So all you need to know is just how to find that in the menu or press the right shortcut key. Yeah? But that's what makes your programming life much easier. And these are kind of features and makes a difference between different editors because if you have to do this manually, it can actually take a bit of time. <sighs> okay, and uh, so... And for those of you who want to do code formatting manually, but it's not that difficult actually at all. And really you need to be able to show the child-parent relationship. And for example, these two elements are inside head, so there should be one level to the right, that's all. And you should have line break for each of the elements. So meta has its own line, type has its own line, each one has its own line, that's all. And then sometimes you have children inside the children, then you have to two level inside. So article is inside body, and head is inside, so H1 is inside article again. That's all you need to do, that's all. And there's some, say, there's some like weird conventions. For example, this one is a tag inside the P, which is a paragraph, which most of you would know, but this one does not have its own line and because essentially this do is just um, make the text italic and by convention people just don't give it extra lines that's all that's just two rules and have a proper line break and show the parent child relationship okay and uh, so some of you might not aware of this is that and for any web page, you can always see any website, you can always see its source code. So this is completely from, say, and desktop soft software, say Microsoft Office or even Windows itself. There's no easy way you can see what source code is. But it's opposite for the website. You can always see, see all the source code, or more precisely, the front-end source code. You can't see what's on the server, but whatever is displayed in your browser, you can see it. And um, so, for example, this is Google, and you can see it's quite a simple page, and you can always do, say, view page source, which you can do a lot for this module, and you can see the exact code people as a Google put into that page, which is actually a lot. Okay, but also there's a thing, you can learn how Google created their own pages, what do they use, how they optimize performance, etc., etc. I'm pretty sure there's very good reasons for all of these. And Google is not famous for say, putting lots of unuseful things in the page. OK, and uh, obviously, this way is not very easy to understand code. There's better ways. We're going to maybe look today as well. OK, and you can always learn from other people, like commercial websites, how they do coding this way. And it's not always you can reuse the code, but that's a more subtle issue. We can dis discuss a little bit later. Okay, I think this is the last bit now. Uh, you need to be aware there's something called develop tools, which is now built into more or less all the browsers. And have anyone seen develop tools? Say in Chrome. Come on, you have to. Okay, this is probably the most useful thing ever. So probably even more useful, say, than the views of the code when you're creating your website. And it allows you to much more than the view page source, which is source code for a particular page. And uh, this is how you open it in Chrome, Firefox, I think in Edge also has it. So in Firefox, if you open it up, it looks like this. And this will be your normal page. and. This is develop tools. You can see the HTML code. Uh, you can see the formatting. And you can do debugging as well. So this is to help you find the errors in your code. We don't have really time to go through this. And you can do console. So if we look at this example, so this is our beautiful Google page. And a better way to look at the code is using the develop tools, which you can just right click instead of choosing view page source, choosing inspect. Okay, now we 
have it now. And it might be easier if I put on to the side. Ah, on this side. Okay, that's also fine. So you can see um, if you mouse over something, it will actually will tell you, uh, highlight the part of the page that code is for. So if I pick this one, this particular div, oh, it's a bit small. It also, okay, that's the blue part of the page. And also at the bottom, uh, can I change? Okay. And the bottom, you can see all the CSS formatting applied to this particular div. And this changes as you select different things. But this part shows you all the formattings, and there's many other things you can do about typing in your uh, command and look at other files which is not shown in the HTML and other things. Okay, so is that? Yeah, okay. So this is something we're going to introduce a little bit more in the lab and throughout the module. Okay, yeah, that's all. Yeah, 